To set up the game, you'll start by placing the board on the table. You'll then take your black market cards with the two resources side, shuffle them all up and place them on the two resources space. Then take the reward cards, shuffle these all up and you want to have two per player plus one. So for a two player game, we'll put five on this space next to the cathedral here. Then the deck cards and multiplier cards can just be put to the side of the board. Now shuffle all the blue backed apprentice cards and we'll then place one card face up on each of these apprentice spaces here and then the deck will just go to the side of the board. The green backed building cards will all get shuffled up and then placed on the board here. And then all the resources will want to be put near the board in easy reach. I like to put them in these little takeaway pots here, just so that they're easy to move around the table if you need to. You'll then put four of the coins in the tax stand. Each player needs to take a player board. This grey one here is for if you're using the bot, so if you're not using the automated bot, just put that back in the box. With the player boards, they have a colourful side and a less colourful side. Now, if you're wanting to play your first game and just want a basic game, then you'll use the colourful side here. If you're doing that, you'll simply then take the two tokens and the 20 workers of your colour and place them on your board. You'll then randomly pick a first player who will receive three silver coins and then you go round the table in player order, giving them one more coin. So the second player would get four coins, third five coins, etc. Each player will also need to put one of their tokens on the seven spot of the virtue track and one below the cathedral. Then deal each player four of the building cards and they'll draft three of these to keep drafting one at a time and then passing to the left. So say they keep that one, pass that one over there, they pass these over here, and then this one, they keep that one, and they pass, they keep that one and pass, and then finally you're left with two, you pick one to keep each, and the ones you don't keep go to the bottom of the stack. And you're all set up. If you're playing the colourful side. You may want to use the variable setup though, which is what I prefer to do. Now, this means that you're gonna have differences in how each player starts the game, and also each player is gonna have a special ability denoted here. So, things to note here is that the number that comes first in the kind of castle thing is how many of your workers start off in prison. So in this case, four of theirs start off in the prison, they start off with five silver coins. Now this replaces the whole first player gets free, so on. And their starting virtue is also given here. It's not just start at seven. So this player, for example, starts at five. You then also get a bonus resource, or in this case, it's actually a card rather than a resource. So after the draft is done, they'll just draw a single card and add it to their hand. The other difference is whoever has the highest starting virtue will be your first player. Okay, so we're all set up, but what are you actually trying to do? Well, in Architects of the West Kingdom, the king has just taken over a new area of land and is wanting to build it up. And you're all the architects who have been hired by the king to do this. But of course, you want to be the one who does the most and impresses the king most. What this all equates to is a race for victory points. Now, there are lots of different ways to get victory points. The main ways, though, are to build buildings, which you'll have cards in your hand for, and to work on the cathedral and build the cathedral up to increase the church's reputation. You can also get points for your virtue, resources, lots of different ways, but we'll go into that in a little bit. Now, the game is broken down into player turns. So you'll start with the first player and then just go clockwise around the table until the end of the game. And the game will end based on the number of players. So when your guild hall here fills up, you'll then have one last turn each. Now, if you're using two players, you only use these first three columns. If you've got three players, you use an extra column. Four, you go to here. And five, you use the whole grid. The player's turn is simple. If they have workers on their board, then they'll take their turn by placing a single worker onto the main board. If they don't have any workers on their board, their turn is simply retrieving a single worker from the main board onto their player board. 
Where the turns get interesting is with the choices of where you can place your workers. Now, these black market spaces down here can only ever have one worker in each. However, the bigger circle spaces of most of the locations can have any number of workers from any number of players. The guild hall here is special. Whenever you place a worker in the guild hall, it will take up one of the spaces of the grid, as I showed when I was talking about the end of the game. Workers can never leave the guild hall, and the black market they only leave when the black market resets, which I'll talk about in a short while. The simplest of the spaces are in the middle of the board here. So you have the forest. When you go here, you'll gain one wood per worker you have here. So the first time you go here, you've only got the one worker. So you get to take one wood from the supply. If on a later turn, however, I go there again, I've now got two workers there, so I gain two wood. And this is kind of one of the key concepts of this game, is that the more workers you have somewhere, the better you are there. And it's important to note that it doesn't matter if other players go there, it's not going to affect how much you gain. That would still be one worker, not three workers. The quarry works the exact same way, but you gain stone rather than wood with the mines. When you go here, you gain one clay automatically and then an additional clay per worker. So you gain two clay the first worker, you'd gain three for the second, four for the third, for example. Now, the other option is you do have another action you can take here. So instead of placing worker and gaining clay, you can place your worker and gain gold. So if I placed my third worker here, I can get one gold per two workers. Now I have three workers, which only gets me one. It doesn't get me two because you don't like round up or anything. If I was just placing the one worker there and didn't have any others, so let's say purple goes there, they don't have the option to get gold because they only have the one worker, so they can only get the two clay. The silversmith is much the same way, except for you gain silver. So one silver plus one per worker means two silver for a single worker. At the tax stand, you'll lose two virtue when you go here, and it's not affected by how many workers you have there. So purple goes here, they'll lose two virtue, so they move down on the virtue track, but they get to take all the money that's in the tax stand. If we build up money here again through taxes and purple goes here again, as I say, it doesn't make any difference how many workers they have. So they would lose the two virtue and take the money again. With the black market, when you go here, you choose whether you go to one of the three spaces. So you can go to the first, second or third, and they do different things depending on which one you go to. If there's already a worker on one, you cannot go to it. Only one worker can go to each space. Now, the costs associated with these, the first space will cost you one silver and one virtue. The second space will cost you two silver and a virtue. The third space will cost you three silver and a virtue. So going to the black market is kind of bad. You will lose virtue for it. It's important to note that if your virtue is 10 or higher, you cannot go to the black market. You're just too good, they won't let you in. Now, if you go to the first space, you gain the resources shown on the card. So in this case, you'd gain a gold and a wood. If you go to the second space, you can choose to either gain any one apprentice, and I'll talk about the apprentice market in a moment when we come to the workshop, or you can draw five of these building cards and choose one to keep. The third space here allows you to gain four resources as shown in the picture. So at the start of the game, this is gonna be two marble, a stone and a wood. Workers that go to the black market stay there until the black market resets. Now, there are a couple of ways this can happen. Firstly, if all three spaces of the black market get filled, then this will trigger a black market reset, whereby the three workers in the black market go to jail. You flip over the card that's in the small market spot into the large market spot, so you're changing what goods you can get, and then each player with three or more workers in the prison here. So blue has five, but let's say they had six. Purple has two, so purple is fine. Blue, with their six, will lose 
a virtue. You only lose one. Even though they've got six, which is two multiples of three, it's three or more, not per three in there. Whoever has the most, which is, in this case, blue, also takes a deck card. Now, a deck card is going to be minus two points at the end of the game. But it is possible to get rid of these, and I'll explain that later. A black market reset is also triggered when either of these two spaces is covered by a worker. But you can't cover these until you've covered the higher up ones, and I'll talk about that in a bit. The King's Storehouse has two possible actions, and the number of actions you can perform is based on the number of workers you have. So if Blue places one worker there, they can perform one action. And you do gain additional actions from apprentices sometimes, such as this apprentice here gives you an additional action. It doesn't mean that when you go there you automatically do it, it's just another action to choose from. So you'd have three actions to choose from, but you can still only perform the one action. So the action options, you can either do two of stone, wood or clay, and that's any combination. So it doesn't have to be two of the same resource or different resources, and that'll allow you to increase your virtue by one. So you simply move up on the track. Or you can do three wood or stone in order to gain a marble. So this is one of the main ways to gain marble, either using the king's storehouse or using the black market. If Blue had two workers there, they could choose to perform both of these actions, or one of the actions twice, so that if they had enough wood and stone, they could get two marble, for example. The workshop also has a choice of actions, but this is another location, much like with the mines, where you can only perform one action no matter how many workers you have there, but the efficiency of that action is affected. So let's say purple goes here, they can choose to either gain an apprentice, which are these cards here, based on paying money, or they can gain more building cards. So when they go here, it's one building card plus one per two workers. So in this case, by going here, they could take a single building card and add that to their hand. If they had two workers, then they could take two. If they were choosing the top action to gain apprentices, they need to pay two coins to tax. So whenever you see red coins, they're going to be tax. Whenever you see the silver coins, they go to the supply. So in this case, two coins would go to tax and two to the supply. Then they can take an apprentice. Now, if they've only got one worker there, they can pick from here, two from here, three from this column, or earlier if they wish to, four any of them are up for grabs. Now, they can actually get further. So in this case, they have one, but say they wanted the peddler here. They could pay a coin to each of the ones that they're skipping past. So they have one, they could go here. So they need to pay two extra coins to push it to here. And the coins go on these apprentices here. And they would gain this apprentice and they would put it in front of them. Now, apprentices give you icons which meet building requirements, which we'll talk about in a bit. They also potentially give you immediate effects of virtue, loss or gain. So if it's a torn in half virtue, it's a loss. If it's solid, it's a gain. And they might give you additional abilities. So this one for here will allow you to do an extra action option at the King's Storehouse. You have some which are when the black market resets. This one is at the black market as is this one, which gives you additional resources when you go to the black market. So I just mentioned there about paying tax. And this is why having a low virtue, although you're going to end up with minus points, could be a good thing. Because if you get down to these bottom levels here, you pay either one or two less tax whenever you would pay tax. You just ignore that completely. However, if you have four or less virtue, you can't work on the cathedral. They just won't let you. And if you go off the bottom here, or would go off the bottom here, instead of moving, you take a debt card, which is negative points. Which, one way to get rid of, would be to get to the top of the virtue track here. And then whenever you would gain virtue, you instead return a debt card to the supply. So you might be wondering by this point, we've been placing lots of workers out onto the board, but never actually retrieving any, and there's no rounds, so there's no point at which you retrieve them. 
that's where locations like the town centre are going to become very important because they help you towards getting your people back. Now, when you place a worker here, you're able to capture workers. So you can play one tax with one worker in order to capture one colour from one location. So you could capture your own and that would put them back on your player board available to use. Or, for instance, you could choose to capture yellow here and then you would take those. Now, if you have multiple workers here, you can pay additional money for each, with each additional worker to capture an additional colour. So I could go, yeah, I want to get my two blue back and I'll also capture this purple. But I wouldn't be able to say, I'll take my two blue and these three yellow because they're at different locations. Now, there is one small caveat to this, which of course is very important because this is two can play that game. In a two player game, you can actually take from up to two locations. But each color at a location is separate. So I couldn't treat those three blue from these two locations as one capture, but I could choose to do the two of mine free of the yellow colour. So let's say I do that. I capture those and those. The ones of my colour just join my workers on my player board. The enemy ones go in my captured space on my player board. It's important to note you can't capture anything out of the prison here. You can't take anything out of the guild hall or the black market. So what do we now do with those workers now we've captured them? Well, one option is to just hold them on your player board to make it harder for your opponents to get their workers. The other option is if you visit the guardhouse, you can perform one action for each person you have here. So this is much like the king's storehouse. The first option is you can imprison captured workers. So say the free yellow that I had, I could choose to imprison those, taking them from my player board and putting them into the prison, which may cost the player virtue and give them debt if the black market gets reset. Additionally, it will gain me money. So I gain one coin per worker. So that would be three coins gained for me, which isn't a bad way to get money. Another option is I could choose, instead of putting those in, to retrieve all of my workers that are in the prison. I break them out of prison. Well, I don't break them out. I just get them out. This is going to be a big important way to get workers back because you can get a large number back in one go, assuming people have put them into prison, which they're likely to have done in order to get the money. The next option here is to release workers. So say Purple had two of my workers held captive on their player board. I could get those workers back, but it's pretty expensive to do. You have to pay two tax plus three silver coins or take a debt and reduce your virtue. But you get to take all your captured workers from all player boards. The final option is another way to get rid of those pesky debt cards. And again, it's an expensive option because it costs free tax and free silver. But the benefit here is you don't just discard it, you flip the card. And when you flip it, you immediately gain a virtue. So instead of losing points, you're gaining virtue which can be quite good. Now, obviously, in this situation, I was only able to retrieve my workers. I wasn't able to free my captured ones because I only had one worker. Say I had two, I could have also sold these. And then maybe that would have given me enough money that if I had three there, as well as selling these, releasing mine, I could have also done the releasing the captured ones. The final location where you can place workers is the guild hall. Now, when you place a worker in the guild hall, you'll place it in the top leftmost space. Now, as spaces fill up, you'll fill an entire row before you then move on to the next one. Now, if you've got three players, you'll go up to the three plus, four plus or five plus, depending on the number of players. So in a two player game, we'll only use these first three columns. So the next worker to go here would go on this space here. And eventually you will fill these up to the point where you cover these market reset spaces, which will reset the black market as we've already discussed. So there are two options when you go to the guild hall. You can either build a building or work on the cathedral. Now, building a building is reliant on a couple of things. 
So firstly, you have requirements with regards to your apprentices, potentially. This one, for example, doesn't. And secondly, you have the resources you need to spend in order to build it. So this one, I would need an apprentice with a bricklayer and a wood chopping. So say I had these two, that would give me these symbols that I need. Now, you can get multiple symbols from one apprentice and that will then cover you for your building. So to build this, for example, I would pay those resources back to the supply and I would have the apprentices for that. With these, you gain victory points at the end of the game for ones that are built based on the number there. So there is quite a bit of variation in these. This one is four, that's ten, so that's a big difference. But they also potentially have immediate virtue effects or immediate resource gains, for example. Some have end game benefits. So for this one, each debt equals three lost victory points rather than just two. This gives one virtue per two flipped debts. Or instead of building a building, you could choose to work on the cathedral. Now, working on the cathedral allows you to move your token up into one of these spaces. So for the first level, will require you to give up a building card from your hand, so you just return that to the bottom of the building card's pile, and also a gold, and that allows you to move up, and that will mean that you're getting points at the end of the game. You also then get to take a reward card, which will give you virtue and potentially other things as well. So for example, this one gives you a building card. If you run out of reward cards, you still always gain a virtue when you perform this. It's important to note that as you go up in building this cathedral, spaces start to become limited. And at the top here, only one person can be the final brick on the cathedral. If, say, you had three players and you wanted to move up, but there are no spaces available, you would have to wait until a space became available. So if you were on this row here and you wanted to move up, you'd have to wait until either the purple or blue moved up one, allowing you to then move up. So that is all the locations. The game will end once you have filled up the guild hall here. So once this is all filled up, each player is then going to have one more turn. Now, although the guild hall is full, you can still perform guild hall actions on that turn. You then total up points, and whoever has the most wins, and you'll add up the points for buildings that you have in front of you, only your built ones, not ones that you didn't actually get round to building. You'll add your points for where you are on the cathedral. You'll add your points for where you are on the virtue track. And this may be minus points for you. You'll then lose points for your debts. You gain one point per gold and per marble that you have in your player area. For every 10 silver coins, and there isn't any nearest rounding up or anything like that, it's just either you have the 10 or you don't, you'll gain one point. And then for every two workers that you have in prison at the end of the game, you'll lose one point. And again, if you had three, this would still only be minus one point. You may then also have cards such as buildings that give end game effects and bonuses to your points. So you'll need to take those into account. Whoever has the most is the winner. And that's how you play Architects of the West Kingdom.